kind of give your pitch to those parents to what exactly would be the benefits of their kid getting involved in something like this, even if they don't necessarily come from an ag background. I remember the day I came home and told my mom that I was joining FFA. She looked at me with these big bug eyes and was like, what the heck is that? <laughs> and I told her, I said, well, I really don't know, but they want me to be here. And it was that sense of belonging that I had not really felt at my school before. Huh. Hey, fellow tacticians. Be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell. That supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. We are going to interview a couple of the state officers from the Alabama FFA Association. So for this evening, we have joining us in the studio today, Olivia Powers, the Alabama FFA reporter, and Brianna Payne, the Alabama FFA senator. Welcome to the program, ladies. Thank you for being with us. I can tell you're really excited. To be here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, it's, it's great to have you all with us, and we appreciate you being generous with your time. It's always a pleasure to bring in some state officers, especially considering that I used to be a state officer myself. And so that's something that I always look forward to. So if you would go ahead and tell the audience, and we'll start with you, um, Olivia, uh, tell me a little bit about your background and how you got involved in the FFA to begin with. So I actually originally approached my advisor about be being a part of the FFA in seventh grade. Um, most members, they like to have the story where they were voluntold. Well, I voluntold my ag teacher that I was going to do it. Um, so I already knew that I wanted to be a part of it. Now it's just scared little seventh grader with my lunchbox. I ate lunch. So, in what the was the room. reason that you had such a strong desire to be in it? Was it your family or, or how did that happen? Oh, so I have grown up showing cattle and horses. Um, ah, yeah. <laughs> makes sense. So cattle and horses, so do you have a, uh, I'm, I'm guessing your family owns some land. Is that like your primary source of income or is it just a hobby thing kind of that they do on the side? It's definitely more of a hobby slash money pit, <laughs> to be quite honest with you. Sadly, a lot of agriculture yeah. projects are. <laughs> Very much so. I, I know the joys and discomforts of agricultural life. And oh, holding in more fondness, definitely, so. <laughs> definitely. All right. Um, so what about you, Brianna? What what drew you into the FFA? So my story is more like the voluntold spectrum of FFA members. Okay. I was put into an ag class my seventh grade year, and I actually looked at the advisor and the teacher of that class and said, I'm in the wrong room. And she said, nope, you're here for the year. Make the best of it. And I got started in the creed, and then I was like, yeah, this is where I'm supposed to be. And here I am now. Yeah, you, you like the creed, huh? That's, I do like the creed. Is, is that a contest you got involved with? Yes, I actually won state creed speaking in 2017. Okay, so uh, for the audience, I could tell them, but I'd, I'd rather you do it. Um, just give them a little background and insight into what all the creed entails. So the FFA creed is our standards and our love for this association, the things that we stand by, the things that we promote, and it's kind of our rules in a sense what we like to uphold. And the creed contest, you say all five paragraphs of the creed and you deliver it to judges and then they'll ask you questions on the creed. Can be agriculturally related questions and can be your favorite paragraph and why. And I actually won district, then I went to state in one state, then I placed in the bronze level at nationals. That's very impressive. Now, I, I know personally I did do creed contests, but I never made it past the chapter level. So you made it significantly farther <laughs> than me. I got beat in my first contest. So uh, congratulations on that and going on to represent the state of Alabama. That's that's very difficult to do. They only get one representative per state. And so if, if you were the state winner, that says a lot about your ability to do that, uh, especially when it comes to the questions like the creed, yes. you know, there's only so much you can do presentation wide, but especially with the questions, you have to be able to think very quickly to be able to do those. Yes, sir. All right. So uh, since we have already kind of talked about the contest a little bit, Olivia, have you been involved in any career development events? Um, actually, quite a few. My chapter, I'm from the Thorsby chapter of FFA, and our chapter is super CD heavy. I was stuck in two teams. My 
school not stuck in, but like, hey, this is what you're going to do my seventh grade year. I've done livestock. I've done meats evaluation, took that to nationals, poultry evaluation, won state with my team. Super proud of that. That was the last That's one I did. That's super impressive it's because for people that very don't know, competitive. Yeah, poultry is super competitive in the state of Alabama. It's, it's one of our largest ag industries, and the contest reflects that. There's a lot of chapters that are really good at poultry. Yeah, uh, Thorsby, top place individual, if I do say so myself. <laughs> um, but that was the online contest here. Uh, so... I also did horse evaluation and nursery and landscape and environment. Good gracious. You've been involved in just about everything and, and had a <laughs> yeah. good bit of success. I mean, not that you were just involved in everything, but you actually won state in a contest. That's impressive. It is very hardcore in my chapter. And I, de <laughs> I definitely got sucked into that mindset. Yeah. Well, uh, just sort of as a general rule, and either one of you can answer this if you'd like, uh, what would you say is the advantage having gone through some career development events yourself? Uh, what are some of the advantages that you've, you've been able to get from that? And, and what are some advantages that just the general FFA member can get uh, going through this? So, well, would you like to? Talk about me. So for me personally, when I got started in FFA mm -hmm. and I started the creed, I didn't even want to say it in front of the classroom. I was so shy, shook. I was quaking in my knees as I said those paragraphs mm -hmm. to my class. And then my advisor was like, hey, you're going to say this in front of all these people. And I was like, no. <laughs> and I almost passed out. And then she made me do it. And here I am now going to talk to chapters all the time, getting to do interviews like this and going out and showing, hey, I'm a product of what CDEs can do. They can change you. They can help you become more of a person. I've learned interview skills from all the many interviews we've done. And from those questions, thinking fast on your feet, that is a life skill because mm -hmm. there are things we call elevator speeches in FFA where you get in an elevator and someone asks you, hey, what is that jacket you're wearing? You have to be able to think fast. And that's something that can happen to you in everyday life. For me, just the biggest thing it's taught me is how to study. Um, coming from a small school, our, uh, our, hmm, our, not an education style, but education style is pretty laid back. Um, we do all the normal things, but, you know, just being in a college class and having taken college classes, you have to know how to study for the real world, and you mm. have to know how to study for an officer position, and just being able to know how to do that and learn myself and my study style was huge as far as CDs went. Yeah, those are a couple of great examples, and I'll tell you, I didn't, coming from a rural school myself, I didn't really learn how to study until I got into the master's program here at Faulkner, so... Uh, you know, I'm now I'm reading, you know, massive books on theology every week. And it's, uh, it's a little too much for me to handle, to be honest, and some sometimes, but, you know, you learn, learn to soldier through it. And I'm a product of my CDs as well. I mean, the reason I'm able to do this show is because I was involved in prepared public speaking, extemp uh, speaking, Carly Pro. Uh, I did livestock judging and there's, there's a public speaking aspect of that. You have to be able to give reasons and be able to back up why you made the decisions that you did, which I mean, that's what politics is all about. And so in a lot of ways, I'm the product of the CDEs that I went through as an FFA member myself. So I understand exactly what you're talking about. Um, what about some of your supervised agricultural experience projects? If you would give us a little insight into that. And Brianna, we can start with you. So my SAE is not necessarily traditional. Mine is in ag education. I started in the ninth grade going and job shadowing ag teachers that were surrounding Lincoln. Then mm -hmm. in the 10th grade, I started actually creating lesson plans after I'd watched how those lesson plans play out, started creating my own. And then I was asked by a Lincoln Elementary School teacher if I would come and deliver one of my lessons. And I said, you know what? I would like to do this quarterly. So every nine weeks, I would go over to the elementary school and teach a lesson to a preschool, first grade, and a fifth grade classroom. That was, those were the three I did until COVID. And then the schools were shut down. So yeah. I had to reevaluate and that's how Rooted and Ag got started, which is my Facebook channel where I post all of my videos. They're like three minutes long. It's just a short little blip of, hey, this is what this ag product does. And then we do a cute little activity with it to help the kids remember. Oh, a fellow YouTuber. Well, that's yes. cool. Uh, hopefully YouTube is less likely to ban your videos than they are <laughs> mine because I, I get strikes against me all the time. So um, they're, they're really mad about something I said about Dr. Fauci a while back. But anyway. So, <laughs> Olivia, what, 
Olivia, what about you? Uh, what, what was your SAE? So I have two SAEs, one being um, equine science and the other being uh, beef production through placement. And both of those SAEs, you know, it's either our family farm, equine science, or a family friend's farm, beef production through placement. And I have shown both of those uh, species and just being in the show circuit teaches you so much, especially how to handle pressure and how to work diligently and work hard all day long. And mm -hmm. it's really given me appreci an appreciation for being able to go to bed. You know, you're, you're exhausted, your body's exhausted, your mind ex is exhausted. And that's the, first of all, that's the best sleep you'll ever have. <laughs> <laughs> and second of all, it just gives you some satisfaction. So I, I will say personally, I think there's no sleep like post-national convention sleep. I mean, that's the <laughs> best. <laughs> you sleep for like two days after that. Yes. <laughs> Uh, but anyway, one thing that I did want to ask you about that, since uh, I actually showed myself, um, when it comes to being able to show animals, I think that there is, and this is really directed at both of you, there's a lot of cynicism about your generation, especially Gen Z, that they complain all the time, that they're snowflakes, that they don't work hard. And uh, if you go to state or national convention, like, you see an awful lot of young people that are not afraid to get their hands dirty. They're not afraid to work hard and they're not afraid to put in the effort and time needed to be successful in these projects. And so uh, I think that, you know, in a lot of ways, your generation FFA uh, will help change that perspective if, if people just get a chance to get to know you and understand more about your organization. Um, one thing that I, I wanted to ask too, since you guys are the reporter in the Sentinel now, I know what that means because I was an FFA member. We might have some people in our audience that don't. So, uh, Olivia, we'll start with you this time. What does the FFA reporter do? So the reporter um, in opening ceremonies it states that we inform the people, and that is pretty much exactly what we do. I, in my duties, I handle social media, um, a lot of our sponsor outreach, and um, the newsletter that we put up on our uh, Alabama Association website. And so I believe that's actually called the FFA reporter, isn't it? Yes, it is. It is. Yeah. Um, so social media is a big part of what I do, along with all of the other standard across the board, across the officer team duties. All right. And uh, Brianna, what are the duties of a Sentinel? So Sentinel in opening ceremonies, it is stationed by the door. And my duties are to make sure that everyone is welcome, to make sure that the meeting room is kept orderly, to make sure that the president and all the other officers have exactly what they need so that we're able to carry out our duties. So I kind of refer to myself as the mesh of the team. I make sure everyone has everything that they need and I make sure that everyone's getting along and that everybody that is involved in whatever we're doing, whatever activity that is, that they're all good and they're excited to be there. And if y'all knew Brianna, that fits <laughs> her so perfectly. She literally is the glue that holds us together. Everybody loves her. Well, that is great that they picked you for that position because I'm a former state sentinel, which I thought was a terrible idea. <laughs> you guys picked the most socially awkward member of my team and put him as the sentinel. Good job, guys. No, I'm kidding. No, I love being a sentinel. I really did. It's a great position. Um, so I, I thought that maybe it'd be interesting to talk about this. And, and you kind of mentioned this a little bit, Brianna, with your SAE and having to sort of rethink how to do that with uh, everything that happened with the virus. FFA really was hit hard by this because the thing that we do is get together and talk about things. We're an ag education organization, and that's a lot more difficult when you can't meet with people. And so if you would just kind of tell the audience about uh, what your plans are for being able to reset FFA and get back into sort of a sense of normalcy, because I, I know for a year we didn't have a whole lot of state contests, or if we did, we had to do them very differently, and the convention was very different. So, so how do you adjust to those kinds of things? Right now, our biggest focus is trying to get our membership back up. Mm -hmm. We lost quite a few members, which kind of doesn't affect us as much as it affected some other organizations. However, our membership is the thing that, thing that allows us to go out and do state convention. It is what allows us to get to do all the many things that we do as state officers. And so trying to put, push that membership to come back up and also trying to make sure that everyone is able to come back together again. Because like you said, that is what our organization is all about. We're about connecting. We're about forming that bond so that we're able to better serve and tell what agriculture actually is. So that's who our main focus is. Yeah, Olivia, since you're the reporter, I mean, I imagine that your job got significantly 
uh, affected by the fact that you're not able to meet up with people as often as you used to or have to readjust that? And so what were some of the adjustments that you had to make and, and what, what, which ones do you plan to make in the future? Now that we're trending towards a positive kind of space to where we can get together and where we can do things, mm -hmm. um, it's getting much more easier. And it's getting to the point to where it is sort of what we used to do. But I know um, on the district team and on last year's team, it was super hard to just find things to post about and find things to talk about when you're writing your newsletter because there's not really all that much you can do and you have done. So what we have done in the past and what we will continue to um, maintain, and I think it's really sustainable, is to be able to talk about members and what they're doing on their own and how that chapter is surviving through COVID and what they're doing to keep everything up. It's really um, because we're not allowed to do as much as a state officer team and district officer team and gather that way. What we've done is focus on chapters and individuals and members and what they're doing that's good. Well, that's actually something that I wouldn't have thought of personally, because, you know, you think media, somebody that deals specifically with social media, the reporter, you wouldn't have as much adjustment for you because, you know, you can still do pretty much all that stuff. You can still write articles, that kind of thing. Uh, but you can't write articles if there's nothing to write about. Exactly. And so that does <laughs> present a challenge. It's like you were like uh, the end of the Watchmen movie where they don't have anything to report on. They're just like you know, doing a bunch of fluff pieces. Yep. Um, but yeah, so I can see how that would have definitely been a challenge. Uh, what would you say FFA as a whole is, is going to try to do moving forward, not just as a result of, of the pandemic and trying to get back to contests, but uh, uh, what are some of your goals? What are the things that you guys are aspiring to do for the FFA in the future? Brianna? What, one of my main goals is to make sure that everyone is included, to make sure that our membership as a whole is is focused on all of us being together, focused on us kind of getting back to agriculture in a sense, not focusing on competitions as much, but focusing on what exactly FFA is and what we stand for. My mom works at Alabama Institute for the Deaf and Blind, which is how when I got started in the creed, I actually signed the creed. That's what got me as far as it did is I signed it. No one had ever seen that before. That is pretty cool. Exactly. <laughs> Still, that is I what can't... I'm known for today. <laughs> Hey, signing girl. Yes. Yeah. I'm like, you're like, hey, you signed the creed. The reason I did that is to show that, hey, AIDB actually has an FFA chapter. They didn't come out and do anything because they didn't feel like they were included. So that mm -hmm. is one of my goals is to make sure that everyone is seen and everyone is heard and that we all have a voice so that we're able to then promote agricultural awareness. Well, side note, and I know that we're, we're kind of talking inside baseball here live on the air. Uh, but get in touch with my dad because one of his goals at the State Department is to make sure that we have a way for private schools to get a charter. And so if, if inclusion is part of that, then that mm -hmm. would definitely be something he'd be interested in. Uh, but as far as that goes, that is actually a really cool thing. I can only sign Jesus Loves Me and only like a <laughs> course of that. So uh, definitely something that I think that FFA could, could benefit from having more people like that in there. Um, more people that are that are interested in, in making sure that inclusion takes place. So, you know, I commend you for that. That's, that's really, really cool. Um, Olivia, what about you? So just a general goal that I've had in running pretty much since I started running for district in ninth grade is um, there are those chapters that they are so super strong in one area and they're so good at it. Like my chapter with CDEs and, you know, that's their strength. That's what they're proud of. There will always be just a handful of kids in that chapter, in that community that are like, you know what? I really want to do this, but I don't feel like I have the opportunity to because my chapter doesn't have the resources and we're not, we're not educated on that. And my advisor, he's, he's wonderful, absolutely fabulous. And, um, Anybody pretty much could say this about theirs, but you know, there are just some areas where you might be interested in, and that's just not somewhere they've ever been able to gain ground. Um, so it's it's an uphill battle when you're coming from a chapter um, that is super strong and something that's on um, a different spectrum from what you want to do. So I want to uh, become a resource to members that feel that way, and I want there to be an outlet to where members can reach out to other advisors that are maybe super good at that, other members that are good at that, and um, just get to where if you would like to do something, you feel comfortable going after it. Um, and there is no ambition 
that can be directed in somewhere where you're not passionate about and it be used correctly. So that's something I've really uh, felt passionate about and just educating people on, you know, you're super good at this. Hey, there is an opportunity within our organization to channel your interest. Yeah, and that's something that I think that we're getting good at, partly because of the onset of technology. Because in the past, you might have an ag teacher that's fantastic at livestock, for example, but doesn't know beans about teaching a public speaker, but might have a kid that's really interested in that. And so I think that there's been more of an effort, at least that I've seen from my perspective, of ag teachers being willing to actually, uh, you know, do a, do a little bit of uh, maybe I help your chapter out with this, and, and then you come and help my chapter out with that next week and that kind of thing. And so I, I really do think that that's because, you know, FFA is such a big organization, it's impossible to be good at everything. You just can't do it. Um, and, and because it does, you know, have so many different moving parts and, and aspects to it, that's just the case. So as a result, I think that's a really good thing that you're working towards there. And actually, Not Ashamed Media is trying to help with that a little bit, my company that I've started here. And uh, we're, we're doing some working on it, trying to get some funding from the State Department, but uh, I'm, I'm working with Jared on that. Uh, to get some instructional videos for different CDEs and different SAE projects by, and we're trying to get different ag teachers all over the state to come in here and record some educational videos on that. So definitely something that I'm interested in. And I think that the, the organization as a whole will, will really benefit from that. So one thing I wanted to ask both of you and just kind of get your perspective on this, we've been talking a lot about uh, the organization and people that might be interested in the organization itself, but there might be some of my viewers that are new to FFA, they don't really know what it is, maybe they didn't have it back where they grew up, and so they're unfamiliar with it, but they think, you know, that that's a farm kid thing, that's for kids that are actually raising livestock or raising crops or something like that, that's not really something my child needs, uh, needs to be involved in or would have any interest in. Um, if you could kind of give what you're talking about, your elevator speech, uh, kind of give your pitch to those parents, to what exactly would be the benefits of their kid getting involved in something like this, even if they don't necessarily come from an ag background? I remember the day I came home and told my mom that I was joining FFA. She looked at me with these big bug eyes and was like, what the heck is that? <laughs> and I told her, I said, well, I really don't know, but they want me to be here. And it was that sense of belonging that I had not really felt at my school before huh. because my school is more sports and athletics. I actually played basketball. I'm four foot eleven. <laughs> Me playing basketball is a pretty interesting thing. Are you saying that there are high schools in Alabama where <laughs> athletics is a big deal? Yes, I oh, am. Surprise! Yes. Shocker! I know. Shocker! I, I, I Shocker. can't believe it. I... <laughs> yes. So for me, having that sense of belonging was a really big thing. Then, as I progressed with the creed and I started going to competitions, I remember my very first state convention. I was with all the high schoolers, so I already felt cool me and my little seventh grade self. And they were telling me how this organization is about promoting agriculture, but it's also about building leadership skills. And I was like, okay, I want to do this. So my mom has watched me grow and she's just followed along. She's been great. My mom is my biggest supporter. She helps me through everything because there's been times that I've just cried over interview positions, cried over competitions. I was like, I'm not good enough to do this. I can't do this. And then she reminds me why I got started in this organization and why I am where I am today, and that is to promote agriculture, but also to build those leadership skills. Yeah, I can't wait for State Convention to come back in full to where we're doing it the way we used to, because I've always said that's one of our biggest recruitment tools. If you can get a kid to State Convention, I'm not saying that he'll be like a lifelong member or anything, but you're going to get some involvement out of that kid more often than not. And, you know, a lot of my audience is here in the capital city, too. That's a big event for Montgomery, and I was glad to see it come back to Montgomery because the Renaissance is a great facility, and, uh, you know, for about a week downtown, you see nothing but a sea of blue jackets everywhere you go, uh, which is a little annoying if you're trying to eat at a <laughs> restaurant there, but other than that, it's great. <laughs> now, I, I love seeing seeing y'all, and I can't wait for uh, next year when y'all are going to come back in full force and you guys will be presiding over that convention. Uh, Olivia, same question. Okay, can you repeat same question? We kind of have got off on <laughs> we, tangent. We did. We, yeah. Well, um, th this is a secret I'm going to let you in on. Talk show hosts typically like to talk, and so I apologize for that. <laughs> I kind of, uh, I, I'm the reason for that. But uh, I was, I was kind of asking about um, what would your elevator pitch be to somebody that they're 
their a parent that has a kid that's in FFA or in high school, but they don't know if they should have any involvement in FFA because they think that's just a, a farm kid kind of thing. So coming from production agriculture, I already knew it was something I wanted to do. But for kids that are from a more urban, more suburban, you know, place, it's just as simple as, and it's it's in our mission statement that you know agriculture is a tool that we're using. It's a vehicle to build leaders. It is what we're here for and it is what we're advocating for, but it's just kind of a, uh, it really is the vehicle that we develop student leaders from. So it's not just about agriculture, although that's what's at our heart. It's really about the students and their potential. Well said. Well, I got to tell you one last thing that I, I will mention before we leave for those of you that may not be as familiar with the organization that are contemplating whether or not their kids should get involved in it. Uh, I want you also to notice, because there has been a stigma with FFA for a long time, that the, the boys go into FFA and the girls go into home ec. Well, we, we've got two lovely ladies here with us today. And uh, in my experience, the women have an awful lot of the leadership roles in FFA. They're very involved in it, and the membership itself is pretty diverse. We're split pretty evenly. So, um, you know, I don't see any reason why. You, you mentioned that you only have one guy on your state <laughs> We, we do. God Paul bless Wesley. him. <laughs> lucky, lucky kid. Lucky kid. Uh, but, yeah, so uh, being women in the FFA, I mean, I think you guys are prime examples of that. Oh, definitely. Yeah, there's there's not much of a women typically, especially when they're younger, um, our, our little brains work differently. <laughs> um, but I think we use that to our advantage and we definitely uh, know how to harness that and apply it. And we apply ourselves pretty well. Uh, so women are kind of pretty prevalent in this state in leadership positions in ag. Yeah, there's six guys across the state of Alabama right now that are in a leadership position with FFA, mm -hmm. with the districts and the state. Wow. So, and, and for uh, those of you who don't know, there's three districts. So that's uh, six times four, mm -hmm. which would be, and so if there's only six of them, that's what, 25%? Yep. <laughs> yeah. So the girls kind of run the thing. I, I used to joke, we had a, uh, we had women start taking leadership positions. Y'all were brought in in 1969, mm -hmm. and y'all already had a national officer by, like, 1971, <laughs> I think. So, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah we, we let them in, and they took over. That was a <laughs> huge mistake on our part. I don't know how we lost that vote. But anyway, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, glad to have y'all here, and uh, women have been a, a huge asset to the FFA, and you guys are, are both testaments to that. It's a good thing that we integrated back in the 60s the way that we did. Um, I always do this with all of my guests before we sign off because, you know, I don't have perfect knowledge and so there might be some things that you guys might want to share with the audience that I wouldn't think to ask. And so if there's anything that you guys would think that, you know, maybe my audience needs to know that I wouldn't have thought to ask, uh, if you would just go ahead and I'll give you the floor. Uh, to use a part of the pro term there. Uh, I'll give you the floor to uh, speak freely. Is there anything else you'd like to tell the audience? So I know that there are a lot of girls that like pageants and that might think that this organization is all hands-on and all about farming. Um, I'm actually Talaga County's Teen Miss Agribusiness for 2021. I was for 2022. I also show a horse. There are no limits to what you can do in this organization. If you want to do it, somebody will help you find how to do that thing <laughs> oh yeah 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 if you want to get involved ffa people are super helpful yes absolutely there is no there's no boundary that you feel that you could have that would prevent you from being successful in ffa absolutely nothing all right well ladies thank you so much for being with us it's been an absolute pleasure olivia powers the alabama ffa reporter from the thorsby chapter is that yes, correct? yes, that yeah. is. And uh, Brianna Payne, the Alabama FFA Sentinel from the Lincoln chapter. Lincoln chapter. All right. Well, guys, thank you so much for being with us here. It's been an absolute pleasure being able to speak with you today. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you made it all the way to the end, it must mean you like what you saw and should like and subscribe. That or you were just super bored, wound up here by accident, and were too lazy to turn the video off before now. Now, I hope you're the first type of person, but if you happen to be the second type, doesn't really matter to me. I got a view out of you either way. Huh. Profiting off of the laziness of others.
This must be what it feels like to be a Democrat. 